at the royalty of the Negro vaudeville circuit, the Whitman Sisters. They were deconstructing ideas of race and gender in their acts, as well as being incubators of some of the greatest black talent show business has ever seen. The Whitman Sisters first got their start when their father, Reverend Alston Albury Alston, Reverend Albury Alston, the Whitman Sisters got their start when Reverend Albury Alston Whitman gave him singing and dancing lessons, thinking that they would join him on his evangelical circuit and help him at church fundraisers. They demonstrated a remarkable musical talent at a very early age, and even caught the eye of the legendary George Walker. But their father intervened. So the sisters instead continued their education as 1899 rolls around, Mabel and Essie, the two oldest Whitman sisters at 19 and 17 respectively, had aspirations of bigger goals. They formed an act together, the Danzette sisters, and toured throughout Missouri and Florida. They made their professional debut as Filler at the Orpheum Theatre in Kansas, Missouri. This was their big break as the manager of the Orpheum Theatre signed the sisters to do a tour of the Orpheum, Coal, and Castle Swadville circuits. With their father's permission, of course. And it made them one of the few black performers performing on a predominantly white vaudeville circuit at the time. After the success of their tour, the third sister, Alberta, affectionately known as Bert Whitman, was allowed to join the tour. The oldest sister, Mabel, would take care of the bookings. Essie designed and made all the costumes. Bert composed the music as well as acting as the group's financial secretary. What a power trio! Their father, Reverend Whitman, allegedly disowned the girls because they weren't performing religious music and not performing on the evangelical circuit. His disdain was not surprising for the time. It's the early 1900s. Upstanding African-American families have to cultivate an air of respectability in order not to face prejudice for the time. But it's 1904 now, and the three Whitman sisters have a banger of a year. They're now based out of New Orleans, and they've rebranded themselves as the Whitman sisters and the New Orleans troubadours, and began taking on other acts to join their company. And here is where I want to take a quick moment to just run through some of the reasons why the oldest sister of the troupe, Miss Mabel Whitman, is a complete and utter badass. Just really quickly, it's 1904. Miss Mabel Women's probably one of the only black women to be running her own theater company, managing it, booking it in the best southern venues. She was a pioneer. Not to mention, when they were at Birmingham's Jefferson Theater, she insisted that black patrons be allowed to sit in the dress circle and the parquet, forcing the theater to integrate for the very first time. Okay. One more, just one more reason why Mabel Whitman is my new hero for what it means to be a strong, powerful woman. The Regal Theatre in Chicago tried to take advantage of her, refusing to pay the agreed upon amount and wanting to underpay her and her company. She threatened to leave. They called her bluff, so she left! She walked out. She walked across the street to the Metropolitan Theatre next door and basically demanded they build a stage and she performed there with her troupe for two weeks, ruining the Regal's business. This is a woman you do not mess with. In 1909, their mother, Caddy Women, passed away. Alice, the youngest of the four sisters, had been caring for their ailing mother, and now that her mother had passed, she joined the troupe. While they're based out of New Orleans and forming this new troubadour troupe group, Mabel Whitman decided to go on tour solo. She grabbed a couple of picks, uh, or pickanannies, which refer to young, talented dancers, formed her own pick show, Mabel Whitman and the Dixie Boys, and toured throughout the US, Europe, and Australia, sending money home to her sisters in New Orleans. It is assumed that her sisters continued performing as there is no break in the records saying that they stopped when she left. When Miss Mabel returned, the Whitman sisters reorganized the group as the Whitman sister, and began performing all over the country, and by 1910 they had earned the title of royalty of Negro vaudeville. For the next 30 years they were at the top of their field. If the Whitman sister show came to town, come rain, come shine, everybody was going to be there. It was a show no one would miss. They also were the greatest incubator for black talent that the world has ever known. Their company would fluctuate between 20 and 30 performers and gave rise to such stars as Jenny Ligon, Bill Robinson, Ethel Waters, Pops and Louie, and who else but Count Basie. Because May was a woman, she had a distinct advantage when it came to booking and securing child acts. As the matriarch of the troupe, she assured parents that their kids would be safe with her and would also be educated. If they didn't do their homework in time, they weren't allowed to perform it. Catherine Basie started off as a dancer with the Whitman sisters and said, Any mother could tell you that if your daughter was with the Whitman sisters, she was safe. We couldn't drink or smoke, and each of the young girls had to travel by car with one of the sisters. They wouldn't let us ride in the bus. Now, if you're me, you're already suitably impressed by the Whitman sisters, but there's more! 
They would carefully choose when to present as white or black on stage. They were light-skinned enough to pass and therefore use their complexion to their advantage, even dyeing their hair blonde and styling it like a Gibson girl, which were drawings of ideal feminine beauty exclusively focused on white women. By doing this, they turned the definitions of color and race upside down. They could use humor to work out anxieties about race and passing on stage, often catching their audience off guard. Essie Whitman wrote, The audience was always puzzled, and someone was sure to ask, what are those white women doing up there? They would recognize it as us and laugh in amazement. They would also don blackface to perform as black women, and challenge the audience to consider what really a black woman was and looked like. Each of the Whitman sisters, in their own individual acts, challenged what the audience's assumptions were about race and gender. By undermining the race and gender categories of their day, while insisting upon high class status and challenging the assumptions of audiences, producers, and theater owners, the Whitman sisters made the vaudeville stage of their time into an expected site of resistance in the mores of a world molded by segregation. Alberta was considered one of the best male impersonators of her time, fooling audiences who thought they were watching a boy-girl act, only to realize that it was Bert and her little sister Alice dancing together. If we look to gender theorist Judith Butler, she argued that identity is not inherent, but is something that is made and created through power dynamics and performative behaviors. In her book, Bodies That Matter, Judith Butler argued that gender is performed and created through regularized and constrained repetition of norms. Performance is not a singular act or event, but a ritualized production. By successfully performing the rituals of what it is to perform as a man, Bert was challenging her audiences to consider what it is to have a delineation between male and female. Something that she probably wouldn't have put in her own words, but I think is an incredibly amazing political and social commentary for the time. Alice Whitman was one of the best female tap dancers of her time. Jenny Lagon, a fellow female tap dancer who had a phenomenal career after her start with the Whitman sisters, said of Alice, The best there was. She was tops. She was better than Ann Miller, Eleanor Powell, and me, and anybody else you wanted to put her to. She could do all the ballet stuff like Eleanor, and then she could hoof. But she never went out on her own, you know? She stayed with the sisters. It was highly unusual at the time to have a solo female tap dancer. All of the girls in the chorus line could do tap, but very few of them actually performed solo. Performing a solo tap piece was mostly reserved for men. The women sisters stood for something. They were the ones I was going to build a monument for on Broadway. They knew talent when they saw it and gave hundreds of dancers their first big break. I wanted to take a moment to celebrate the Women's Sisters, not just because they were talented at singing and dancing. I haven't even spoken about Berta's voice yet. Oh my gosh, Berta's voice. Oh, there's just not enough time. I don't think there's enough time for me to go into how incredible these sisters were. Most of my information today comes from two main sources. Dance and Identity Politics in American Negro Vaudeville, The Whitman Sisters, 1900 to 1935 by Nadine A. George. From Dancing Many Drums, Excavations in African American Dance by Thomas F. de France, 2002. My second source was Jazz Dance, The Story of American Vernacular Dance by Marshall and Jean Stearns, 1994. Both these books have a chapter on the Whitman Sisters, and I highly recommend you go ahead and read one after another. In Dancing Many Drums, de France critiques jazz dance for being pointedly apolitical. I don't think that I could talk about this dance without getting political. It is not a dance that can be talked about apolitically. It's a really interesting case study to just read the chapter about the Whitman Sisters from Jazz Dance and the chapter about the Whitman Sisters from Dancing Many Drums. The story that they're telling is the same. The information that they're delivering to you about the sisters and the historical context they lived in is the same to the most part, but in Dancing Many Drums, you explore the political and social implications of what they were doing and have an understanding of how gender theory and identity politics plays a part in what they were doing and what they were creating at the time. I don't think that this dance is apolitical. I think this is a highly political dance, and I don't think there's any point in us not talking about it. On that note, I am going to continue to talk about the history of this dance. Whenever I find a story that excites me about the history of this dance, I will share it with you because that is what I do and I promise to you I will not shy away from the politics. I don't think it is correct to be apolitical about this stuff. So 
Thank you so much for watching. I know that this is a really long video, but I have barely begun to scratch the surface of how incredibly amazing the Women's Sisters are. I'm really hoping that this inspires you to go ahead and do more research. I'll put links to the books that I read and also further reading in the doobly-doo. I hope you go check them out. If you would like, I'm also going to share some of the notes that I made over on my Patreon. Don't worry, you don't have to pay to see it. It'll just be there. Click over to my Patreon. If you do like what you see there, consider subscribing and supporting me on Patreon because it does make a difference to my ability to continue making these videos and not have to get a job teaching English. So I would really, really, really appreciate that. Consider subscribing if you want more historical and political videos in your newsfeed and check out my previous videos that I've made about the history of this dance because I think they're pretty swell. Thanks!